Good morning, and welcome to Grace Harvest Bible Church as we come and we gather in God's house today to remember the resurrection of our Lord and Savior as we come and we have fellowshiped, we have uh, gone to Sunday school, we have sung praises to our Lord, we have given first fruits, and now we come to the preaching of His Word. And I've titled this sermon today, Shut Your Mouth, Shut Your Mouth. So, um, but before we get there, there's a couple things I want to uh, share with the congregation that uh, next year, February the 23rd of 2025, uh, Justin Peters will be coming again to the church. Uh, I reached out to him, the elders, uh, last end of last summer. Uh, we decided we would have him back, and so I made contact with Justin back in October of, of 2023, and he never replied. So the elders are going to stop asking me to get in touch with these people. So I reached out to him again here last week, and uh, you know he ghosted me for all those months, and I said, hey, uh, Justin, uh, I, I sent you a text a while back, and uh, you've never responded, so I just want to know, the elders would really like you to come to Grace Harvest this year. Can you make it? Well, he responded back, and he said that, Pastor, I can't come this year. I'm, I'm completely booked, and I'm thinking, well, if you'd have talked to me back in October. But anyway, uh, I showed grace, and uh, he, because I still wanted him to come. And uh, so he said, how about next year, January, February? And I said, okay, that works out great. January, February, just let me know. Silence on the other end. And I'm like, I'm not waiting. Six months again. So I said, text him back, I'm waiting, Justin. <laughs> and he waited. He said, oh, I'm sorry I was on the phone. And I said, I'm just messing with you. Just uh, let me know what works for you. So February 23rd. And I'm, I'm praying that uh, uh, with God's will, everything goes well. Um, if we get started by May, we should be in our building um, by the uh, end of February. So uh, that would be really an awesome thing to be able to be in at that time if we're able to, if, God, if God's will be done in that area, and have Justin come and speak at our, when we enter into our new building. So please put that on your calendars, February the 23rd of 2025. So, um, you know, I, I woke up this morning and I love it when it rains. I love it when it rains. I, my wife is the exact opposite of me. She wants to see the sun shining, and I like the rain. I like, it's just this melancholy that I like. It just, it just, uh, it's a sense of I see God in everything, even in the sunshine and in the rain. And, and the rain gives us pause sometimes. And I met a, I met a kindred spirit today. I was standing at the back uh, steps at the eight, before the 8 o'clock service started, and uh, Brian Hayes was back there, and he says, what a beautiful day. And I said, amen. And he thought I was joking. He goes, oh, so you like the sun? I said, no, Brian, I love it when it rains. <laughs> and then he told me after the, right before, after Sunday school, he said, Pastor, did I, did, can I tell you why I like it when it rains so much? And I said, yeah, tell me. He said, because when I do greenhouse work, that means on Sunday I don't have to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I'm glad we made it to God's house today uh, to enjoy being here. I'm waiting, uh, Kyle, I'm waiting for the Gatorade to be poured on me. Uh, Kyle showed me a a little meme that said, uh, show your enthusiasm for being at church today. This, this is uh, Super Bowl Sunday. Make sure you pour Gatorade on top of your pastor. I said, well, make sure that I finish preaching before you do that. But I'm thankful that God has brought us here together as we turn in our Bibles to Romans. And we're going to do something a little bit different this morning before I get started in the sermon. Um, I, I want to remind us that uh, we, we are looking here, as, uh, as I said last week, almost if you would, a court case. Almost if you would a court case. And uh, so let's review what has happened in this court case that God has placed mankind under indictment. We've already learned that God is extremely angry. He has a righteous anger. We call it wrath. And he is filled with his righteous anger against sinful man. Romans 1, verse 18, and I hope you have your Bibles open as we go through some of these verses this morning before we get to our opening passage. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and un un unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So God brings the charge against mankind, that everybody born of men and women are under the wrath of God. And so the trial begins here. And with, with that opening argument, men immediately do what we always do. We stand before God and try to present our case against Him. 
and on our behalf. And so they, they, they're explaining, basically, Paul takes this, walks us through the arguments that men make so that they don't have to be judged. At first, they plead ignorance. They plead ignorance. Of course, that didn't work, for all men re- really do know. So let's go back to verse 18. I'm going to read down through 20. For the wrath of God, chapter 1, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world has his invisible attributes, both his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. So he defeats that very first argument. That didn't work. So others pleaded that they were his people and they had some kind of special knowledge. Look at Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, you are without excuse, O man, everyone who passes judgment, for in that which you judged another, you condemn yourselves, for you who judge practice the same things. He was talking to the self-righteous Jews here who, who, who claimed that they were doing everything they were supposed to do, and yet God holds them guilty because they weren't living what they said they were doing. They had disregarded the law of God, even though they were given, it was given to them. And then next, men try to justify themselves by their works, but that didn't appease God either. Look at Romans chapter 2 and verses 28 and 29. Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision, circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. It's not of works. It does, circumcision doesn't save us. Keeping the law doesn't save us. It means that our heart has been circumcised. We have repented and we have believed in what God has said and then at this point man realized that his situation is desperate he's standing before this court and ignorance was no excuse knowledge was no excuse works didn't appease him works was a false hope that the people were relying on and some of us today some of you who are gathered here today may may think somehow that uh, this doesn't apply to me That somehow I'm going to skirt past this, and when it's my turn to defend myself before God, then I'll be okay. Well, maybe you're like what happens to some, and they begin to accuse God. They know they were guilty, these men and women who stand, and you may even believe yourself to be guilty before a holy God, but now you're trying to get off on a technicality. In law enforcement, I saw it many times. You go to court and, and you would see cases lost because uh, s- some part of the officer made a mistake and he didn't say he didn't Mirandaize somebody, didn't advise him rights, or, or he, he did an improper search and, and uh, they deem uh, the fruits of the poisonous tree and anything that was. So he goes and he searches the car. He finds the murder weapon to the car. He goes and he makes the arrest on the guy and the guy makes a confession. The reason he made the arrest was because the gun was found in the car, but it was an illegal search. So his confession is inadmissible in court. The guy walks. He walks. Well, folks, there will be no walking away from God's court. There will be no technicalities whatsoever in the court of God. Yeah, um, Romans 3, three says, What then, if someone did not believe... Does their unbelief abolish their faithfulness of God? So basically what he's asking is, so, you know, the person who doesn't believe is, what's up, what happens with him? I mean, you're going to judge everybody the same? And that didn't work. They're not going to be acquitted. And then, and, and we think of all these things here. And so then they accuse God of being ungrateful. Look at Romans 3, 7. But if through my lie the truth of God abound to his glory, why am I also still being judged as a sinner? Hey, God, you know, how can he blame me for this stuff? It's not, it's not my fault. And so as we enter the, the verses today in Romans chapter 3, verse 19 through 20, I, want to take, I wanted to give us a little overview again so we remind ourselves what Paul has walked us through, how we've gotten to the place where we've gotten today in this scripture. 
And if you're anything like me, and uh, you have a tendency to blame other people when you make a mistake, okay? It's in our nature to, to deflect. And so we try to protect ourselves, and sometimes we will, we'll, we'll, we'll blame other people. So if you doubt that, think about the last time that you were driving down the road, and somebody cut you off, and you said, man, that's a good driver there. That's an expert driver. I must have been doing something wrong to assume that he cut me off. I must not have been paying attention. I dare say there's not a man or woman here who's been driving any length of time ever had that conversation with themselves. It's always the one that I have, uh, that I have. As a matter of fact, I found out that my daughter is a little mini-me when it comes to driving. Uh, I was on the phone with her not too long ago, and she's driving down the road, and I'm talking to her, and we usually talk every day, and usually it's when she's driving back and forth somewhere. And um, I'm talking to Crystal, and all of a sudden, I go, she goes, you idiot! <laughs> well, I knew she wasn't talking to me because I didn't say anything. That's stupid. She was talking about the driver, and I, thought, I started laughing to myself. Oh, that's Mark Wells. That's Mark Wells. Why? Because we have a tendency to, to blame other people for mistakes. Fallen man, by their self-centered nature, has a tendency to think that they are without fault. You and I who came to Saving Faith, we used to think that way. We used to think we were good enough, that, uh, that uh, you know, God, I'm, I'm a good enough person. I'm, I'm going to get to heaven. Uh, God's going to let me in. He's going to give me my wings. I'm going to sit up there in a little bit of a big, fat little cherubim, and I'm going to sit up there playing on a harp and do all the things I like to do here on earth. Wow. Wow, that's the furthest thing from the truth, isn't it? God calls you and he saves you and, and you realize that it was your wretchedness and your wickedness and your depravity that God called you out of that. You know, we, we, we sometimes will, will, um, will criticize other people, but yet ourselves, we, we justify everything we do. One day, everyone, everyone will stand before God. You and I, as believers of Christ, we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Fully righteous, made righteous because of what God has done for us. And we will not stand in judgment over our sin that cost us our salvation. You will hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, from God and from Jesus. Why? Because he, you belong to him. And, and you will hear those words and and. and we will lose some rewards because of the sin that we commit and the disobedience that we do, but we will never, never cost us our salvation. And yet, the ungodly will stand before the great white throne judgment, which we know that God has given His Son the right to judge the living and the dead. It took me a long time to grasp that because I always heard the great white throne judgment of God and the judgment seat of Christ, and I always thought, well, Daddy sits on the the last one and Jesus the son sits on the first one because we belong to him but God himself the father said I give the right to the son to judge the living and the dead and on that day on that terrible day even some of you who are sitting here in your in your blind ignorance of God and deny who he is will stand before Christ himself on that day and he will condemn you to hell and you will receive justice just as he is warning you here today. You are being warned. You are, I don't want you to think that you're here by accident today if you don't know Christ. You're here because God wants to warn you and remind you, especially if you've sat week after week through, through the 15 sermons that we've gotten until verses 19 and 20 today. That you sat through these sermons, you've heard over and over again how you are guilty, 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 guilty. And there's nothing you did, can do to acquit yourself. Nothing. It's, it's, it's as if, and let's put it in today, we understand. It's like if we were standing here right now and we saw a fight take, break, take place outside and we see a guy go to his car, he takes out a gun, he walks back, I hate you and shoot you and kills you. It says all of us have witnessed that, and all of us are testifying against that person. He's not going free. And that's the same way it is for God's justice when it comes to the time when an unbeliever stands before him and says, I wasn't that bad. No, you broke one commandment. You broke them all. And so that is the, 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 the opening argument, the presentation of the evidence, and the closing arguments that Paul makes for the sake 
of you who are gathered here today and don't know Christ as Savior. And for us, we rejoice in that. It should remind us of what God has saved us from. And at that point, when you die, it will be too late to plead for mercy. There is no second chance. There is no do-over. There is no mulligan. There's no an opportunity for you to say, well, whoa, wait a minute, God, you, you, you don't understand. I thought I had more time. Well, today is the day of your salvation, not tomorrow. The devil will whisper you in the ear and tell you, you've got plenty of time for that. Enjoy life. You're young. Do whatever you want to do now. The most difficult people to reach with the gospel are our relatively good people, right? We know there's none that's good, but they think they are. And especially good religious people who think that because they, 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 they're a deacon in a church or an elder in a church or a preacher, that, that somehow um, they are good enough to get in to heaven on their own and they have never truly repented and received Christ as Savior. They go to church. They're outwardly moral. You would look at them and say they're a good, upstanding citizen of the United States of America and, and they're good people. They're always willing to help their neighbors. I know a lot of Mormons that are really good people and they're going to hell. They don't know Christ as Savior. I know a lot of good atheists. Good, as the world would deem good, they're going to hell because they deny the existence of God. And the last thing ever I would want is somebody that entered this church to go to hell because they hadn't heard the gospel. That's not going to happen here. This should never happen in a church in America and around the world. The gospel should always and constantly be proclaimed. It should be the, the focus of our life. It should be the desire of our heart to share the love and joy that comes from knowing Christ as Savior. But too many people take pride in, your, in their good deeds. They think, sure, I've got my faults, but who doesn't? But God knows that I'm basically a good person. Criminals and terrorists, they deserve hell. Child molesters, they deserve hell. Rapists, they deserve hell. Not me, preacher, not me at all. You see, filled with self-righteousness, they trust in their good works to justify them on Judgment Day. They don't see their need for a Savior from sin, and so they never need to repent of their sins and trust in Jesus Christ. Why is it so important that we repent? You know, it says, Jesus says, repent and believe. And I, I tell you, there's these progressive quote-unquote Christians out there, they're not Christian preachers, who say that you don't need to repent in order to be a, a believer, that, that the Bible never teaches repentance. I'm like, oh, just open up the book. But what, why? why? Why is there a need of repentance? The need for repentance is because you acknowledge before God that you are a sinner. That's what you're doing. When you repent, you're not relying on your self-righteousness anymore. I stand before a holy God and, and realize that I am a sinner. I do need a Savior. And Christ, you are the only one that can redeem me. Instead of, if I don't repent, if I say, hey, hey, I'm going to make Jesus a Savior for my life, and, and I'm going to get all the good things that come along with that, that's, that's good enough for me. I don't need to repent. Well, if you don't need to repent, you don't know Him. If you don't need to repent, you've never trusted Him for your salvation. Because the thing that should have led you to that weeping over your sin was the acknowledgement that you were a sinner in need of a Savior. When you, when, you, when you go someplace, and when I've been to places, and I've watched revivals occur, and I, I saw one, I've shared this before, but there's enough new people here who haven't heard this story before. When I, when I went with Jesse Royal, and, and we were doing the youth at the SBCV up in Lynchburg, and a preacher got up there, and he never mentioned the cross he never mentioned the blood of Christ. He never meant the death, burial, and resurrection of him. He never mentioned repentance. He told some really cool stories. And at the end of the night, hundreds of kids came to the altar, laughing and kidding and joking and carrying on. And so my heart broke. My heart broke. And we go back for the, for the session where they, they always do after you do conferences like this, and they, and they ask. Now, I was, I was a nobody then. I mean, I was just, I was in charge of their security. I was still a policeman. I was going to seminary. And, and the lead um, person from the SBCV that was in charge of their youth said, 
man, Mark, hey, man, Jesse, wasn't that awesome tonight? All those hundred kids, those hundreds of kids coming to Christ. And I said, nope. What? You didn't think that was wonderful they came to Christ? I said, how, how in the world? I said, there might have been one or two that somebody had shared the gospel with who, who came forward that, that night, last tonight. But tell me how someone's going to come to Saving Faith if they don't even know that they're sinners in need of a Savior. How are they going to come to Saving Faith if they don't know that Christ died and, and, and he, was, he was humiliated for the sake of their sin, that he rose from the dead and he sits at the right hand of the Father and because of his blood and forgiveness of sins and call for repentance and call for making him Lord and Savior. Well, somebody got a hold of that preacher because the next night when he got up there, he preached the gospel. Five to a dozen kids. I can't remember the number. My mind goes as older I get. I can't remember the exact number, but I can tell you it wasn't many. They came forward that night weeping and receiving Christ as Savior. Praise God. Because when you see your sin, you don't laugh. When you see your sin, you're not high-fiving everybody. When you see your sin, you're acknowledging that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And that's what Paul is emphasizing here. He, he's, not trying to, he's not trying to sugarcoat this. He's not making it acceptable for you to come to Christ and say, hey, you know, don't worry about it. I, you know, just take your time. And, and, and you know what? Just God will take you anywhere you are, and he will take us anywhere we are. And you can even actually stay where you're at. Nowhere do you see that in Scripture. We're called to be obedient. And so we see this Paul, this, this, this prosecuting attorney for God, he's summing up the case, and he's still aiming at these self-righteous Jews here. Look at verse 9. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. All under sin. Then to, then to clinch his case with the Jews, he cites from their own scriptures to prove that there are none righteous, no, not even one of them between verses 10 and 18. But he's not quite done. He's not quite done. Paul realizes that religious good sinners are very difficult to convince of their sin. He knows that they still may be thinking this passage you just quoted, Paul, refers only to the wicked Jews or, or to those nasty Gentiles. But I'm a good law-keeping Jew. Those, those verses don't describe me. So now Paul explains that the law speaks to all who are under it. Some think that the Gentiles are not condemned by the law, that only the Jews. But Paul settles that here. Would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word this morning, if you are able? Just two verses, verse 19 and 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are in the law, so that every mouth may be shut and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Oh, well, Father, your people have gathered here this day. And every one of us who has professed your Son as our Lord and Savior, we who have repented of our sin, Father, you opened our eyes to the sin in us. And we cried out to you, Father, each of us cried out to you and repented of our sins and believed in our heart that Jesus, your son, suffered, died, and was buried and rose on the third day, and we are your children. And so, Father, I, I pray that this morning that this sermon would encourage my brothers and sisters in Christ, the sheep of your flock. And, Father, that it would give us a boldness and a desire and the urgency to share the truth of your words. And Father, for the one who does not know you today that's gathered here or online, Father, the one who has been deceived and self-deceived, Lord, I, I pray that their eyes are open today. That a heart of stone turns into a heart of flesh, Father, that you make dead men and dead women alive this very hour. And I ask this in the precious name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, this comes as a complete shock to some people who assume the law was given as the way to God until the time of Christ. You may even have thought that here this morning, that, that somehow that Jesus was plan B, 
that the law was given in order to make men and women righteous before God. And because that men fell, then God had to go, okay, let's, let's settle back, let's punt, let's go to plan B, we'll send Jesus. Folks, that's never the case. The law was never given in order for us to achieve righteousness. The law was given to us so that we, un- we would understand our need for a Savior. In God's wisdom, He sent a Savior that, and, 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 and to make sure that we would have everlasting life. It didn't catch God off guard that when He gave the law that He expected man to keep that law. Even those that He loved could not keep the law. But we know the law was never meant to bring us salvation. And today we will look at the purpose of the law. There are two purposes for the law. Accountability and knowledge described in these two verses. We find two reasons for the law given in in these two verses. Accountability and knowledge. Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are in the law. So that every mouth may be shut. And all the world may become accountable to God. And when you think about accountability, what comes to mind? What comes to mind? Well, what should come to mind, it means that you're held responsible for your own actions. You know, um, Kathy informed me very early in my life that I was a spoiled kid. When I met her, because, you know, I was sitting here trying to tell her, you know, uh, my wife grew up in Chesterfield County, Virginia. She was born at Richmond Memorial Hospital. Uh, she, she, she went to schools in Chesterfield, to Harrogate Elementary School. She went to Carver Middle. She went to, to uh, Thomasdale High School, uh, born and raised in here. And I think she might have, the furthest she had ever gone anywhere was North Carolina. That was it. Never been on a plane in anything. And I start talking to her about, oh, I've been on ships and I've been on airplanes and and uh, yeah, I learned to ski in the Swiss Alps, and I rode on trains all over Europe, and I rode uh, double-decker buses in uh, England and London, and I would go down to the big swimming centers downtown Frankfurt by myself, ride trolley cars down there, and I learned to s- uh, ski on, uh, uh, water ski on Lake Geneva. And she's going to listen to all this, and she's like, you're spoiled. <laughs> I was spoiled. I was one of three children. My sister was 13 years older than me. She was she got married in 1963, and uh, my brother was, was uh, disabled, and he lived with my parents, and, uh, and I, was, I was the mistake that came along in 1956. My sister was born in 43, my brother was born in 49 in Okinawa, uh, and there comes old Junior, and after my dad was graduated from uh, his master's at the University of Maryland and uh, still in the Army. And then... Uh, I got the benefit of him having uh, rank and being stationed where he was stationed, and, and, uh, and that all changed when I was in eighth grade. And my parents sent me back to the States, we were living in Germany, sent me to Miami Military Academy. And for the first time in my life, I had to make my own bed. I had to pick my own clothes up off the floor, which my wife said, you weren't there long enough because you didn't learn that lesson. <laughs> But I remember how I was held accountable for my actions. I'm thinking to myself, this isn't, this isn't fun. But as an eighth grader, I, I started to learn more responsibility. You, see, you know, I, I, it's amazing to me the lack of respect I see from young people. I know what you're all going to say. You're just an old baby boomer. But, you know, my dad taught me how to be a man and and he taught me how to be accountable for things, and he taught me how to take responsibility for my own actions. And it still drives me nuts to this day when I see somebody young enough to be my granddaughter or grandson walk up to me and go, hey, Mark, how you doing? Oh, you, oh please don't do that to me. Or when I hear somebody, when, when I'm talking to a, somebody, or I hear somebody talking to an adult, and I hear him go, yep, uh-huh, yeah, that's right. And your kids are sitting here thinking today, why do my parents insist that I say, I say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, and no, sir, and yes, sir? Because you know, what it, you know what it means when you say that? It means that automatically you are saying to the other person, I respect your being older than me. I respect that. And a lot of times what I'll hear from people is, I don't have to be respect anybody. They've got to earn my respect. That's the problem with the world. That's man's problem against God. And so when, when 
you were raised. And let me tell you what makes all the difference in the world when you go to an interview, young man or young lady. Especially if you're going to walk in with somebody my age. Man, maybe it doesn't make a difference anymore. Maybe I'm just a dinosaur. But I'm going to tell you what, if somebody walks in, if I was hiring somebody and a young man walked up there and said, and, and, and I'm asking him questions, and he, he gives me all one word answers, yep, yep, oh, yep, yep. And the next person comes in and says, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. That doesn't mean they're perfect by any stretch of imagination, but what does it do? The, the, first, ex, the first impression. It shows that somebody's taught this so, something to somebody like this. And, 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 and you have a tendency to think that I can, I can hire this guy because I know at least this young lady, this young man, has been held accountable by his parents. We've raised five children, and I praise God that, that all of them are productive citizens and, and uh, paying my uh, Social Security. And, uh, and I, but I remember when Sean... Uh, joined the Marine Corps. He learned accountability real quick. I can remember standing on the steps of our house in the Grove, and he said, Dad, this is the exact reason I'm joining the Marine Corps. I'm tired of people telling me what to do. <laughs> so let me tell you how they told him what to do. That boy didn't sleep in his bunk or rack. I don't know what y'all call the Marine Corps. He didn't sleep in it. He slept on top of his sheets. He never Never slept under it because he didn't want to, have to take the time to make his bed in the morning. And you know what he did? This strong, young man who couldn't wait to leave home when he called his mama up when he was allowed to call. He didn't call daddy. He called mama up and said, all I want to do, mom, is crawl up in the bed with you and let you hold me. No, they know all about that. <laughs> But he learned, and I tell you what, he came back to mom and dad, and he was thankful, thankful for us, because he saw people in there that had to learn just to be respectful before they could ever be made into Marine. See, we're held accountable, and God wants you and I to understand that we are held accountable for our actions. And again, even as a Christian, you're held accountable for your actions. King David was held accountable for his actions, and he had to repent of his sin. Every, when you see all through scripture and God, I love the good, the bad, and the ugly. It, the, to me, there was no doubt that the Bible was authentic in the word of God because what fool would ever write a book about the followers of a God who messed up all the time? Nobody does that. They would, they would throw all the good in there. You would never see the bad. You, look, think about it when you watch a movie. You see all the good about your hero. You don't see the bad parts of him, but God exposes the good, the bad, and the ugly of of his people and the need for a savior and the need to be held accountable for our actions but see the dreadful thing here this morning if you're an unbeliever that accountability means that you will spend eternity in hell you know it, it, let me stop here for a moment because it's not popular to preach on hell is it and then, nobody wants to hear that, that 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 i will spend eternity in hell i just don't preach about that just talk about the good stuff just talk about the good stuff Joel Olstein teaches the good stuff. He was interviewed by CBS News on Easter Sunday, so I'm assuming it was pre-recorded because I would assume he was in his church, so-called church on an Easter Sunday. And they asked him specifically about hell. And he, the question was, do you feel like you're cheating people by not telling them about the hell part or repentance part? And this was Olstein's answer. Quote, no, I really don't, because it's a different approach. You know, it's not hellfire and brimstone, but I say most people are beaten down enough in, by life. They already feel enough, uh, guilty enough. They're not doing what they should, raising their kids. We can, all, we can all find reasons. So I want them to come to Lakewood or our meetings and be lifted up to say, you know what? I may not be perfect, but I'm moving forward. I'm doing better, and I think that motivates you to do better, he said. Mr. Olstein is not a preacher of God's word. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing. He is, he is speaking a lie straight from the pits of hell. You know what? I may not be perfect, but I'm moving forward is what he wants you to think. See, the Bible pierces our heart with that two-edged sword, doesn't it? And, and I have no authority over you, none. It's the word of God that has authority over you. 
It's your submission to God's authority. And so what I do on Sundays, what, what the teachers do here, what discipleship does, what you, when, you, when you are brothers and sisters in Christ who have fellowship with one another, you encourage one another, but we also correct one another. And what we do is we say we realize that we're a sinner and we need God's to save us and we need to live a life that's wholly pleasing to him we should strive for that instead of being told could you imagine if i got up here every week and well we probably we probably had to build a building 10 years ago if i told everybody oh don't worry about hell there's no, no word for that just just we're all going to be happy everything is wonderful and that would be a lie that would be a lie and so the Look at the first half of verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are in the law. And this is referring to Jews. The Mosaic law was given to God's people. And Paul is reminding the self-righteous Jews that the law does speak to them. When Paul says in the law, he means that the Jews were expected to obey the law of God. They, was, God didn't just give the law and for them just to ignore it. He didn't give us the command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself, just for us to ignore it, okay? The law doesn't save us, but God gives us the law for us to live our lives. It, it gives us a, a path, a, an owner's manual, if you will, on how to live the Christian life. Look, go back to verse 9 with me here in chapter 3. Paul, Paul says in the law, he means that the Jews were expected again to obey the law. Go verse 9. What then? Are we better? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin, as it is written. There is none righteous. No, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. And all have turned aside. Together they have they've become worthless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asses is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Everyone is guilty here, and the law never, was never given to save them. He, it's a reminder to us. But it's also given to us when you look at these verses, and you should not see yourself in these verses, Christian. This was the former you. You, you should not be full of cursing and bitterness. It grieves me when I hear a Christian curse. It grieves me. I, I, I was, uh, Kathy and I went to um, the grocery shopping yesterday, and I came outside, and I put Kathy in the car, and, and uh, there was a, a young, not a young man, he was in his 50s, and he said, Coach Wells, and I turned around, and I said, Co I couldn't remember his name, but I know that he used to coach, uh, still does coach, and we stopped and talked, and I guess we talked for about 20 minutes. And he's just one profane thing after another out of his mouth. Just one profane thing after another. And he says, oh, by the way, are you still preaching? And I said, I sure am. He said, oh, I guess I shouldn't have cussed so much. He says, you know what? I, I, I think I need to get back in church. He said, he named a church he used to go to. And I thought to myself, you need the gospel. You need the gospel because what comes out of a man's mouth indicates what's in our hearts. And folks, I'm not saying that Christians don't cuss. I'm not saying that. But is it a pattern in your life? It, it, you know, that's the, the great thing. And the law enforcement officers in here will tell you this. There's some, some uh, I, I cursed to something terrible. Even as a Christian, as a law enforcement officer. And, I, and I've, I've said before, you know, it's almost like, well, they won't understand you unless you're cursing. Wow, how sad is that? What, what an immature what an immature faith I had. And one of the advantages of being a preacher is I don't hear it anymore, for the most part. You certainly don't cuss in front of me. <laughs> and, when, and, and the only time I really hear it is when I'm around people that, uh, that come up from my past and will start talking. But Christian, we should reflect the love of Christ. That when people see us, they ought to see something different than they see in the world. And there, and, and there has to be. 
because you were no longer guilty. You realize that? You were no longer guilty of what Paul described in, in verse 9 through verse 18. And then Paul writes, so that every mouth may be shut and all the world may become accountable to God. Have you ever been in a situation where you just had to shut your mouth? <laughs> now, I, 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 I don't know, my mom was Italian and I got told to shut my mouth more times than I can remember. You better shut your mouth. I've heard my wife say it. That old mountain girl will come out and her, you better shut your mouth. And God's telling us that, well, you know what the law does? It shuts our mouth. It shuts our mouth. The Greek word, when it says every mouth, let me tell you what the Greek means here. When it says every, it means every one of you. It means every one of us. It means every person that's ever lived. The world can deny that Christ, that Christ, all they want. But God's law will shut down any arguments. The picture comes to mind of an accused person who's standing before the judge to present his case. But in this case, the judge is the sovereign, holy God, creator of heaven and earth. Here comes the proud atheist, the, the non-believer who, who wrote books about why God doesn't exist and proving that God doesn't exist. And he's trying to argue before God about his delusion. And the law shuts his mouth. Shuts his mouth. What will, they, what will they say? What will they say when they stand before Jesus? They can't defend themselves. And his mouth will be stopped. And there is no more arguments. And I, I can tell you, I have seen the word of God shut people's mouth. Have, have some, a lot of you are familiar with uh, Ray Comfort and his work, the, uh, the Way of the Master. And some of you don't like it. Some of you do. I particularly... Uh, have used that in my evangelism for about 20 years. And I can attest to you, I have watched this very thing happen. Where you ask a, a somebody, it could be a group of two or three people, and you get that one person's attention. <coughs> Excuse me, did you say your name was John? John, I, I need to ask you an important question. If you were to die today, where would you go, heaven or hell? Well, I, I, I don't know, I, I, I'd like to think heaven. Well, why do you think you would go there? Well, I'm, I'm a good person. Can I give you a good person test? So I asked those five questions. And you know, when you ask those questions, have you ever told a lie? Have you ever hated anybody? Have you ever lusted after a woman? Have you ever used the Lord's name in vain? Have you failed to go to church? On your own admission, you're a lying, thieving, and if you said you hate somebody, murderer, adulterer, blasphemer. Do I need to go any further to let you know that you are a sinner? And you know what you watch? You watch the eyes and the mouth is shut because the Word of God has pierced their hearts and that's what shuts their mouth. Oh, I've, I've watched other people laugh and giggle and mock, but the person I'm focused on when I ask that time and time and time again, you see exactly what this verse says. The mouth is shut. Because that moment, God's got their full attention. And when I walk away, I, I don't ask them to make a decision. I would never do that. I hand them a Bible, and I usually say to them at this time, I say, hey, here's my card. If you have any questions, let me know. Can I encourage you just to open up that book I just gave you? You may think it means nothing, but would you do me a favor? Would you read the Gospel of John? Just, just read it, because you're going to find out who Jesus is if you just read that book. Have a great day. Can I pray for you? Is there anything? Most of them walk away. But you see, God's word shuts the mouth of the unbeliever. We need to understand that the law of God holds us, ourselves, accountable to God as well. Moses' law, God's gift to Israel, does not provide any protection from God's eternal judgment on human sin. Not for the Jew, not for the Gentile. But instead, the law reveals our sinfulness and our need to continually repent before the Lord. Your repentance and belief saved you. And you're secure. Because the God who saved you, the Holy Spirit that gave you by His grace, the faith to believe that you confess with your mouth that He is Lord. He saved you. You're saved. You belong to Him. There's no going back. Paul writes to the church in Corinth that you cannot call Jesus Lord unless the Holy Spirit allows you to do it. 
You can't do it unless he allows you to do it. And guess what you can't do as a Christian? You cannot curse God. You love him. You love him and you will not curse him. But the ungodly can and the godly will. So Paul writes it, it to remind us that it shuts our mouth and it gives it, the law holds us accountable. And then the knowledge, the first purpose of the law is accountability, then it's knowledge. Verse 20, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Paul emphatically states that because of the law that shuts one's mouth, no one, no one will be able to be justified before God on their own. How many people do you know that in your own life that says, I'm good, I'm okay, you know, I love you, Mom. I love you, Dad. I love you, Papa. I love you, Granny. Just don't, just, just, I don't want to hear about Jesus anymore. I, I, I'm good. I'm a good person. I do this. I do that. And the whole time, you're, you understand that they are not justified before God. You have been justified. What does that mean? Let me remind you this morning of the doctrine of justification. So to, we need to understand that to, to justified is to be declared Righteous. You are justified as an act of God whereby he pronounces you a sinner to be righteous because of your faith in Christ. Not because of what you've done, but because of your faith in Christ. And proper understanding, and under, if you understand justification, it has to do with God's declaration about a sinner, not any change within me. It's all what God decides to do. God declares me righteous before him because of his faith in his son. I was a dead man in my sin, living in my self-righteousness when I came to saving faith. I didn't need to be saved. I was already a good person. I was a husband. I was a young police officer. I had gone to church my whole life. I had done everything the church told me to do. I was good. Oh, I was wicked to the core on the inside. And so God, in his mercy and grace, he justifies us and declares us righteous. At that moment you were saved, you became righteous. Jesus Christ is the one that finished the required work of justification on the cross. And since we have now been justified, chapter 5, verse 9 of Romans says, since we now have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Don't you just love when you hear people say, I don't want to hear about the blood of Christ. I don't, you, preacher, you don't need to preach on the blood. That's just too gory. I, years ago, when I, a man that I loved dearly, he, he was uh, my boss when I worked undercover. Loved him dearly. And, but... I, I'll never forget this. Came in Monday morning after Easter Sunday. This is like 1986. We come in and he starts talking. And he goes, eh. He said, you're not going to believe what the preacher said yesterday. Church. I said, well, what was that, boss? What was that? He said, he, he described what they did to Jesus. Talked about putting nails in his hands and his feet and how they beat him. And I didn't go to church to hear all that. I didn't go to church on Easter Sunday to hear how, how, how all that horrible stuff they did to Jesus. And I looked at him and I said, boss, if it wasn't for all that horrible stuff, we wouldn't be Christians. They hadn't crucified him. We don't rejoice in the fact that our Savior suffered and died and was buried. It ought to grieve us to the point that we understand that our sin caused him to have to do all that. But we should rejoice that God loved us enough to send his son to suffer and die. Why was God 100% man and 100% God at the same time? Because he had to die. You and I could never satisfy God's anger and wrath against our sin because we're blemished. If you don't think so, what does the Bible say about your righteousness? It's just filthy rags. It's, 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 almost, it's almost Christian... Before we came to safe, it was like we just waddled in the mud all the time. And we thought our clothes were all pretty and it had feces on it and had mud on it. And it was in our hair and in our faces and all over our hands and feet. And they go, look at me, look how good I look. And then God made you white as snow 
when you believed in His Son because He became that sin for us. The one who knew no sin went onto that cross. He took the sins of the world of Mark Wells. Make it personal. He took your sin, that filthiness that just reeked over you, that you enjoyed, that you loved before you came to Christ. And when you, when you came to Christ and you acknowledged all that filth was washed away, all of it, all of it was cleansed because the, the man who knew no sin that became sin for us had to be God in order to be the perfect sacrifice because he never sinned. Never. He never told one lie. He, ne he, ne he never hated anybody. He, he, he never lusted. He, he never gossiped. Can any of us say any of those things? Of course not. But because we have been made righteous before Him and we have been cleansed in His sight, now we say praise God. Praise God for our justification because of Him and not because of us. And you, and you might be confused this morning and, and wonder, how, can, how could God ever forgive me? How could anyone truly be right with God? And I think that's what every Christian finally asks themselves when you come to Saving Faith. You realize that in your own self-righteousness how filthy you actually were. And Job, he asked that question. But how can a man be in the right before God? Job chapter 9, verse 2. How can a man be right? But Jesus made it clear in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Turn in your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. We have time for this this morning. We won't tarry much longer. Luke chapter 18, verse 9 through 14. I still love hearing them pages still turn. Some of you have to scroll to find it, but I love still hearing the pages of Scripture turn. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying these things to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his chest saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For anyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus is telling you and telling me that he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life and no man comes to the Father except through him. You cannot earn your way. You, you cannot be a self-righteous person and think you're better than everybody else. Job knew he needed a Savior. Isaiah knew how wretched he was. Paul knew how wretched he was. And each of us who've come to Saving Faith know how wretched we were and continue to be if it weren't for the mercy and grace of our Lord and Savior. You see, Jesus made it clear that it was possible for God and only God to justify sinful people. Repent and believe and you will be justified. You will be made righteous before God. And in verse 20, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. There is no sin that will not be exposed by the law in the final judgment. You can fool your parents, you can fool your spouse, you can fool your friends and neighbors, you may even fool the preacher, but one person you'll never fool is God. There'll be a reckoning one day. Just like a great prosecuting attorney, Paul nails his closing arguments as I finish today. All are guilty before God. There are none righteous, not one. Not one who seeks after God. Everyone is accountable for their sin against God and all will be condemned if they do not repent and believe. Because of the law, there is no excuse. We have been given the knowledge of sin. You see how God has laid out that argument in these first two chapters, in, the, in these first 20 verses of chapter 3? He lays it out to us. And He lays it out to those who don't know Christ that you are guilty before Him. So, for the believer, for my brothers and sisters here this morning, we may rejoice because we know 
that we have been made righteous, not because of anything we have done, but because of the holy God who loves us. But if you don't know Christ this morning, understand you are without excuse and you have no defense. You will not be able to claim ignorance, nor will you be able to say that I follow people like Joel Osteen and it's not my fault. You have been warned. A storm is coming and there is shelter in only one harbor. And that's in Jesus Christ the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Dear one, trust in Christ alone for your salvation. He is the only one that can save. I pray that if you don't know Christ here today, that you, you, you go home and you meditate from chapter 1 through chapter 3, verse 20. And ask God to reveal Himself to you. Acknowledge your sin before Him. Acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God. Believe in your heart that Jesus raised, was raised from the dead. Understand the wickedness of your own heart. Cry out to Jesus for forgiveness of those sins. Repent of them. The Bible tells us you will be saved. Christian, you may be, have been a believer for a long time, but you know, if you're honest with yourself, that you look more like a brand new believer than you do one who's been one for 10, 20, or 30 years. Some of you need to get on your knees, not here in this room, but by yourself with God and acknowledge how you have allowed the cares of this world to consume you and occupy you. You've, you've been put on a shelf. Oh, I pray you take yourself off the shelf and serve our God. And to my brothers and sisters who grieve this morning because this sermon you know affects somebody that you love dearly and and I would dare say, as a matter of fact, I, I would be as bold to say that everyone in this room knows somebody right now that if they were to die, they would go to hell. Ask yourself, are, do you love them enough to live Christ in front of them? Do you love them eno enough to share the gospel, even if it causes division within that, that relationship? Oh, Christian, don't act like the world. Commit yourself to Christ to live for Him with the help of the Holy Spirit that indwells in you. In just a moment, I will stand in front of you, God's people. And this is the time of invitation, and we don't do anything to manipulate people. We don't prolong songs and keep going because I think somebody needs to come up front. No, that's, that's not at all. But, it, but the Bible tells us that if we come to saving faith, we are... To make that public, Jesus says, those who are ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. Maybe you have come to saving faith and you've never been baptized. Last week we saw two new converts that just received Christ weeks ago who were baptized within two weeks of that and have joined the church. Maybe God's calling you to be obedient in that area. I pray that you come, grab this preacher by the hand and let me know that and I'll sit down with you. We'll set a time to decide to tell you the importance of baptism and the need for baptism. It doesn't save you, but it is an act of obedience. And some of you, God has said, this is the place I want you to serve, and I want you to come, and I want you to join Grace Harvest. I pray that you make that decision known. But also, my brothers and sisters, if you're a member of this body, God has called you to serve the body of Christ. He didn't save you for you to be put on the bench. He saved you to serve, to love, and you can't do that if you're not an active party of the body, part of the body. And I, I, I pray, I pray that, like me, one day you'll wake up and realize that it's not everybody else's responsibility to serve. If no one else does, I will. However God's leading, you come. Father, thank you so much for your word today. 
Thank you for what has happened in this place this day. And Lord, may you receive the glory and honor for it. And may your will be done in our lives as we go forward. In Jesus' precious holy name, amen. You come as the Lord leads, as Pastor Cal leads us in song. Mm -hmm.